Chapter Twenty One, Part Seven of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume Two, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Twenty One: Persecution of Heresy, State of the Church, Part Seven. The cruel and arbitrary disposition of Constantius, which did not always require the provocations of guilt and resistance, was justly exasperated by the tumults of his capital, and the criminal behavior of a faction, which opposed the authority and religion of their sovereign. The ordinary punishments of death, exile, and confiscation were inflicted with partial vigor, and all the Greeks still revere the holy memory of two clerks, a reader, and a subdeacon, who were accused of the murder of Hermogenes and beheaded at the gates of Constantinople. By an edict of Constantius against the Catholics, which has not been judged worthy of a place in the Theodosian Code, those who refused to communicate with the Arian bishops, and particularly with Macedonius, were deprived of the immunities of ecclesiastics and the rights of the Christians. They were compelled to relinquish the possession of the churches, and were strictly prohibited from holding their assemblies within the walls of the city. The execution of this unjust law in the provinces of Thrace and Asia Minor was committed to the zeal of Macedonius. The civil and military powers were directed to obey his commands, and the cruelties exercised by this semi-Aryan tyrant in the support of the Homotian exceeded the commission and disgraced the reign of Constantius. The sacraments of the church were administered to the reluctant victims who denied the vocation and abhorred the principles of Macedonius. The rites of baptism were conferred on women and children who for that purpose had been torn from the arms of their friends and parents. The mouths of the communicants were held open by a wooden engine, while the consecrated bread was forced down their throat. The breasts of tender virgins were either burnt with red-hot eggshells or inhumanely compressed between sharp and heavy boards. The Novatians of Constantinople and the adjacent country, by their firm attachment to the Humusian standard, deserved to be confounded with the Catholics themselves. Macedonius was informed that a large district of Paphlagonia was almost entirely inhabited by these sectaries. He resolved either to convert or extirpate them, and as he distrusted on this occasion the efficacy of an ecclesiastical mission, he commanded a body of four thousand legionaries to march against the rebels, and to reduce the territory of Mantinium under his spiritual division. The Novatian peasants, animated by despair and religious fury, boldly encountered the invaders of their country, and though many of the Paphlagonians were slain, the Roman legions were vanquished by an irregular multitude, armed only with scythes and axes, and, except a few who escaped by ignominious flight, four thousand soldiers were left dead on the field of battle. The successor of Constantius has expressed, in a concise but lively manner, some of the theological calamities which afflicted the empire, and more especially the east, in the reign of a prince who was the slave of his own passions, and those of his eunuchs. Many were imprisoned and persecuted and driven into exile. Whole troops of those who are styled heretics were massacred, particularly at Sisychus and at Samosata. In Paphlagonia, Bithynia, Galatia, and many other provinces, towns and villages were laid waste and utterly destroyed. While the flames of the Arian controversy consumed the vitals of the empire, the African provinces were infested by their peculiar enemies, the savage fanatics, who, under the name of Circumcellians, formed the strength and scandal of the Donatist party. The severe execution of the laws of Constantine had excited a spirit of discontent and resistance, the strenuous efforts of his son Constance to restore the unity of the church exasperated the sentiments of mutual hatred, which had at first occasioned the separation, and the methods of force and corruption employed by the two imperial commissioners, Paul and Macarius, furnished the schismatics with a specious contrast between the maxims of the apostles and the conduct of their pretended successors. The peasants who inhabited the villages of Numidia and Mauritania were a ferocious race, who had been imperfectly reduced under the authority of the Roman laws, 
who were imperfectly converted to the Christian faith, but who were actuated by a blind and furious enthusiasm in the cause of their Donatist teachers. They indignantly supported the exile of their bishops, the demolition of their churches, and the interruption of their secret assemblies. The violence of the officers of justice, who were usually sustained by a military guard, was sometimes repelled with equal violence, and the blood of some popular ecclesiastics, which had been shed in the quarrel, inflamed their rude followers with an eager desire of revenging the death of these holy martyrs. By their own cruelty and rashness, the ministers of persecution sometimes provoked their fate, and the guilt of an accidental tumult precipitated the criminals into despair and rebellion. Driven from their native villages, the Donatist peasants assembled in formidable gangs on the edge of the Getulian desert, and readily exchanged the habits of labor for a life of idleness and rapine, which was consecrated by the name of religion and faintly condemned by the doctors of the sect. The leaders of the Circumcellians assumed the title of Captains of the Saints. Their principal weapon, as they were indifferently provided with swords and spears, was a huge and weighty club, which they termed an Israelite, and the well-known sound of praise be to God, which they used as their cry of war, diffused consternation over the unarmed provinces of Africa. At first their depredations were colored by the plea of necessity, but they soon exceeded the measure of subsistence, indulged without control their intemperance and avarice, burnt the villages which they had pillaged, and reigned the licentious tyrants of the open country. The occupations of husbandry and the administration of justice were interrupted, and, as the circumcellions pretended to restore the primitive equality of mankind, and to reform the abuses of civil society, they opened a secure asylum for the slaves and debtors who flocked in crowds to their holy standard. When they were not resisted, they usually contented themselves with plunder, but the slightest opposition provoked them to acts of violence and murder, and some Catholic priests, who had imprudently signaled their zeal, were tortured by the fanatics with the most refined and wanton barbarity. The spirit of the circumcellions was not always exerted against their defenseless enemies. They engaged and sometimes defeated the troops of the province, and in the bloody action of Bagai they attacked in the open field, but with unsuccessful valor, an advanced guard of the imperial cavalry. The Donatists, who were taken in arms, received, and they soon deserved, the same treatment which might have been shown to the wild beasts of the desert. The captives died without murmur, either by the sword, the axe, or the fire, and the measures of retaliation were multiplied in a rapid proportion, which aggravated the horrors of rebellion and excluded the hope of mutual forgiveness. In the beginning of the present century, the example of the circumcellions has been renewed in the persecution, the boldness, the crimes, and the enthusiasm of the Camisards, and if the fanatics of Languedoc surpass those of Numidia by their military achievements, the Africans maintained their fierce independence with more resolution and perseverance. Such disorders are the natural effects of religious tyranny, but the rage of the Donatists was inflamed by a frenzy of a very extraordinary kind, and which, if it really prevailed among them in so extravagant a degree, cannot surely be paralleled in any country or in any age. Many of these fanatics were possessed with the horror of life and the desire of martyrdom, and they deemed it of little moment by what means or by what hands they perished, if their conduct was sanctified by the intention of devoting themselves to the glory of the true faith and the hope of eternal happiness. Sometimes they rudely disturbed the festivals and profaned the temples of paganism, with the design of exciting the most zealous of the idolaters to revenge the insulted honor of their gods. They sometimes forced their way into the courts of justice, and compelled the affrighted judge to give orders for their immediate execution. They frequently stopped travelers on the public highways, and obliged them to inflict the stroke of martyrdom, by the promise of a reward if they consented, and by the threat of instant death if they refused to grant so very singular a favor. When they were disappointed of every other resource, they announced the day on which, in the presence of their friends and brethren, they should east themselves headlong from some lofty rock, and many precipices were shown which had acquired fame by the number of religious suicides. 
In the actions of these desperate enthusiasts, who were admired by one party as the martyrs of God, and abhorred by the others as the victims of Satan, an impartial philosopher may discover the influence and the last abuse of that inflexible spirit which was originally derived from the character and principles of the Jewish nation. The simple narrative of the intestine divisions which distracted the peace and dishonored the triumph of the church will confirm the remark of a pagan historian and justify the complaint of a venerable bishop. The experience of Ammianus had convinced him that the enmity of the Christians towards each other surpassed the fury of savage beasts against man, and Gregory Nazianin most pathetically laments that the kingdom of heaven was converted by discord into the image of chaos, of a nocturnal tempest, and of hell itself. The fierce and partial writers of the times, ascribing all virtue to themselves and imputing all guilt to their adversaries, have painted the battle of the angels and demons. Our calmer reason will reject such pure and perfect monsters of vice or sanctity, and will impute an equal or at least an indiscriminate measure of good and evil to the hostile sectaries, who assumed and bestowed the appellations of orthodox and heretics. They had been educated in the same religion and in the same civil society. Their hopes and fears in the present or in a future life were balanced in the same proportion. On either side the error might be innocent, the faith sincere, the practice meritorious or corrupt. The passions were excited by similar objects, and they might alternately abuse the favor of the court or of the people. The metaphysical opinions of the Athanasians and the Arians could not influence their moral character, and they were alike actuated by the intolerable spirit which has been extracted from the pure and simple maxims of the gospel. A modern writer who, with a just confidence, has prefixed to his own history the honorable epithets of political and philosophical, accuses the timid prudence of Montesquieu for neglecting to enumerate among the causes of the decline of the empire a law of Constantine, by which the exercise of the pagan worship was absolutely suppressed, and a considerable part of his subjects was left destitute of priests, of temples, and of any public religion. The zeal of the philosophic historian for the rights of mankind has induced him to acquiesce in the ambiguous testimony of those ecclesiastics, who have too lightly ascribed to their favorite hero the merit of a general persecution. Instead of alleging this imaginary law, which would have blazed in the front of the imperial codes, we may safely appeal to the original epistle, which Constantine addressed to the followers of the ancient religion, at a time when he no longer disguised his conversion or dreaded the rivals of his throne. He invites and exhorts, in the most pressing terms, the subjects of the Roman Empire to imitate the example of their master. But he declares that those who still refuse to open their eyes to the celestial light may freely enjoy their temples and their fancied gods. A report that the ceremonies of paganism were suppressed is formally contradicted by the emperor himself who wisely assigns, as the principle of his moderation, the invincible force of habit, of prejudice, and of superstition. Without violating the sanctity of his promise, without alarming the fears of the pagans, the artful monarch advanced, by slow and cautious steps, to undermine the irregular and decayed fabric of polytheism. The partial acts of severity which he occasionally exercised, though they were secretly promoted by a Christian zeal, were colored by the faintest pretenses of justice and the public good, and while Constantine designed to ruin the foundations, he seemed to reform the abuses of the ancient religion. After the example of the wisest of his predecessors, he condemned, under the most rigorous penalties, the occult and impious acts of divination, which excited the vain hopes and sometimes the criminal attempts of those who were discontented with their present condition. An ignominious silence was imposed on the oracles which had been publicly convicted of fraud and falsehood. The effeminate priests of the Nile were abolished, and Constantine discharged the duties of a Roman censor when he gave orders for the demolition of several temples of Phoenicia, in which every mode of prostitution was devoutly practiced in the face of the day and to the honor of Venus. The imperial city of Constantinople was, in some measure, raised at the expense and was adorned with the spoils of the opulent temples of Greece and Asia. 
the sacred property was confiscated, the statues of gods and heroes were transported, with rude familiarity, among a people who considered them as objects, not of adoration, but of curiosity. The gold and silver were restored to circulation, and the magistrates, the bishops, and the eunuchs improved the fortunate occasion of gratifying at once their zeal, their avarice, and their resentment. But these depredations were confined to a small part of the Roman world, and the provinces had been long accustomed to endure the same sacrilegious rapine from the tyranny of princes and proconsuls, who could not be suspected of any design to subvert the established religion. The sons of Constantine trod in the footsteps of their father, with more zeal and with less discretion. The pretenses of rapine and oppression were insensibly multiplied, Every indulgence was shown to the illegal behavior of the Christians, every doubt was explained to the disadvantage of paganism, and the demolition of the temples was celebrated as one of the auspicious events of the reign of Constans and Constantius. The name of Constantius is prefixed to a concise law which might have superseded the necessity of any future prohibitions. It is our pleasure that in all places and in all cities the temples be immediately shut and carefully guarded, that none may have the power of offending. It is likewise our pleasure that all our subjects should abstain from sacrifices. If any one should be guilty of such an act, let him feel the sword of vengeance, and after his execution let his property be confiscated to the public use. We denounce the same penalties against the governors of the provinces if they neglect to punish the criminals. But there is the strongest reason to believe that this formidable edict was either composed without being published, or was published without being executed. The evidence of facts, and the monuments which are still extant of brass and marble, continue to prove the public exercise of the pagan worship during the whole reign of the sons of Constantine. In the east as well as in the west, in cities as well as in the country, a great number of temples were respected, or at least were spared, and the devout multitude still enjoyed the luxury of sacrifices, of festivals, and of processions by the permission or by the connivance of the civil government. About four years after the supposed date of this bloody edict, Constantius visited the temples of Rome, and the decency of his behavior is recommended by a pagan orator as an example worthy of the imitation of succeeding princes. That emperor, says Symmachus, suffered the privileges of the Vestal Virgins to remain inviolate. He bestowed the sacerdotal dignities on the nobles of Rome, granted the customary allowance to defray the expenses of the public rites and sacrifices, and though he had embraced a different religion, he never attempted to deprive the empire of the sacred worship of antiquity. The Senate still presumed to consecrate by solemn decrees the divine memory of their sovereigns, and Constantine himself was associated, after his death, to those gods whom he had renounced and insulted during his life. The title, the ensigns, the prerogatives of sovereign pontiff, which had been instituted by Numa and assumed by Augustus, were accepted without hesitation by seven Christian emperors, who were invested with more absolute authority over the religion which they had deserted than over that which they professed. The divisions of Christianity suspended the ruin of paganism, and the holy war against the infidels was less vigorously prosecuted by princes and bishops, who were more immediately alarmed by the guilt and danger of domestic rebellion. The extirpation of idolatry might have been justified by the established principles of intolerance, but the hostile sects which alternately reigned in the imperial court were mutually apprehensive of alienating, and perhaps exasperating, the mind of a powerful, though declining, faction. Every motive of authority and fashion, of interest and reason, now militated on the side of Christianity, but two or three generations elapsed before their victorious influence was universally felt. The religion which had so long and so lately been established in the Roman Empire was still revered by a numerous people, less attached, indeed, to speculative opinion than to ancient custom. The honors of the state and army were indifferently bestowed on all the subjects of Constantine and Constantius, and a considerable portion of knowledge and wealth and valor was still engaged in the service of polytheism. The superstition of the senator and of the peasant, 
of the poet and the philosopher, was derived from very different causes, but they met with equal devotion in the temples of the gods. Their zeal was insensibly provoked by the insulting triumph of a prescribed sect, and their hopes were revived by the well-grounded confidence that the presumptive heir of the empire, a young and valiant hero, who had delivered Gaul from the arms of the barbarians, had secretly embraced the religion of his ancestors. End of chapter 21, part 7